everybody. Th thanks for joining us on this important call. Um, first of all, for any of you who, who haven't been on calls in the past, um, you know, the mission of U.S. Inventor is very important. It, it is to restore the rights of inventors and, and patent-based startups, rights that existed in America for 100 years that helped America lead the world in innovation, helped us stay ahead of our adversaries, helped us have huge uh, economic success, a uh, key part of the American dream. Of course, that's been uh, very much just dismantled by big tech, and we're fighting very hard to turn that around. And of course, as you know, the whole issue with China uh, threatening to take lead in key technologies relates very much so to our patent system and the way we've disincentivized innovation in those areas here, made those patents easy to invalidate here, where China has strengthened those rights in, in there. So they're, they're actually getting startups based on, on Chinese patents that should be in America. <laughs> it's a serious problem for our country. A um, couple of things I want to tell you guys before we introduce our, our speaker today. Um, first of all, anything you hear on this call is not to be considered legal advice. Uh, even if it sounds like legal advice, it's not. Get with your attorney and, and get legal advice if you need it. Um, although there's some very good information here that you should consider, perhaps, but it's not legal advice. Um, secondly, um, any questions you have, go ahead and raise your hand after after Dr. Spaulding is done, General Spaulding is done. Uh, raise your hands. We'll call on you in order or put your questions into the chat. We just want to try to keep this efficient and, and under somewhat somewhat control, okay? So it's just not a, a crazy thing. We want, we want to be able to address anything that comes up and definitely raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, third thing is, for anybody who's on the call, we're going to have a big discount if you want to come to our uh, U.S. Inventor Conference in October in Washington, D.C., and uh, we'll tell you about that at the at the end of the call. And uh, so I want to introduce uh, Brigadier General Robert Spaulding, uh, retired. Um, General Spaulding, two, 2016 to 2017, was U.S. Senior Defense Official and Defense Attaché to China. 2017 to 18, he was Senior Director for Strategic Planning for the National Security Council. He's written numerous papers and two books. One of the books is Stealth War uh, in 2019, Stealth War, How China Took Over While America's Elite Slept. And 2022, War Without Rules, China's Playbook for Global Domination. Uh, he's the founder and CEO of, am I pronouncing this right? Is, is it Simper? Yeah, Simper. Simper, okay. Uh, and which is a tech company based on, uh, based, basically based on protecting data, which is the most important asset we have. And uh, uh so, so Dr. Spall, and of course, he has is, has been very much involved in the situation between the United States and, and China for a number of years and, and has probably more knowledge about that than way more than any of us have, for sure. Um, so, Dr. Spalding, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. And it's great to, great to talk to you all. And uh, at least this time, we're not huddled in a uh, garage uh, parking lot while, while in a downpour. So we got that going for us. Uh, and then COVID, you know, taught us about, you know, getting in virtually. So um, at least uh, at least we can be in at least uh, an air conditioned space and, and uh, I look forward to your questions. Um, you know, when I uh, when I entered the my career in the military, it was right towards the end of the Cold War. Um, I was just saying that you know, the, the movie that inspired me to join the military was Top Gun. Um, before that, I thought, you know, it was all about people screaming at you and peeling potatoes and I was not going to have any of that, but, you know, flying jets and riding motorcycles and chasing girls sounded like a lot of fun. So, so I ended up uh, joining, although I didn't get in the Navy, they didn't want me, I got in the Air Force. Um, but I had a great, uh, great opportunity in the Air Force to um, not only fly jets, but also go spend some time in China. So I was, I spent two years uh, as an Olmsted scholar, uh, studied uh, Chinese at the Defense Language Institute, was a student at Tongji University in Shanghai, traveled the country, really got to know the people, the culture, history, geography, just about everything uh, you need to know about China, except for the government. And that's the part that, that uh, I kind of stayed away from. Uh, and you know, my impression back then was that it was a great relationship. The U.S.-China relationship was going to be very positive for the world. It's going to be very positive. Uh, for us economically, it's certainly going to be positive for the Chinese economically. The Chinese people were great. Uh, and, you know, when I left in 2004, I thought I'd go back and have a career in China, um, working 
uh, as an American. And, uh, and then I went back, did my thing uh, and rose through the ranks of the Air Force and um, and had and uh, you know several opportunities to work in policy positions having to do with China, and then uh, about um, 2013, as I was leaving Whiteman, uh, for, flying the B2 at the, the for the very last time, um, you know I was on a trajectory that I had really no clue about, but that the Air Force wanted um, to uh, send me eventually back to China to be the senior defense official as a one star. And so I went to the Council on Foreign Relations and then I ended up working for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And really, when I got to the Pentagon in 2014, I, um, I was heavily involved in you know, understanding the islands in the Ch South China Sea. We were trying to figure out how to deal with China and, uh, and the islands that they were building. And I had this, uh, in, in, you know, uh, email that was sent to me by somebody I'd met uh, the year prior at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York that had had investments in China. And it was a presentation created and briefed to the National Security Council the year prior. And it talked about all these different companies that were being attacked. I talk about all this in my book, Stealth War. And it was at that time that I recognized that, you know, my vision of the world, certainly my vision of the China might not be what I thought. And it really caused me, forced me to rethink. And we started doing, I had, a, I had a team of experts that worked for me that all like me spoke Chinese, had lived in China, except unlike me had much more um, you know, to do with the government uh, and had spent time working at the embassy. And so we, uh, we started to do a deep dive on the relationship with China. And what we found you know, ended up being really disturbing. And we started briefing senior military leaders on this, uh, the implications of our relationship with China uh, in terms of uh, what it was doing to our industrial base. And, uh, and that's really where it began. We started looking at you know, what were the implications for capabilities that America needed uh, to maintain a dominance in like jet engines. And we started to realize that China was not only um, creeping up on, you know, uh, capability that was similar to ours, they were actively going after our capabilities, the tooling, the capabilities that we had. And, and we recognized that, you know, if they were going to be successful, like they had been in many other industries, it was going to lead to the elimination of any um, technology gap that the U.S. had with China in terms of a military perspective, but that was just the beginning. That was 2014. Um, now, almost 10 years later, I've learned so much more about the implications of China in our midst, and uh, and certainly I spent almost five years now uh, leading Semper, uh, developing technology and and dealing with the how do we protect intellectual property um, in in the current uh, space. And so I just go back to when I joined the military and the world that we lived in at the time. There was no such thing as globalization. There really was uh, the Internet um, was um, still kind of, you know, very much a research thing amongst universities. It wasn't really for, for another decade that it would become a thing. Um, I remember 1990, you know, eight really is when I got on, I think, Google the first time. So. Um, you know, when I was starting in the military, you know, it was, you know, another 10 years before that. And, and so these things, the internet and globalization um, were just, you know, 10 years into my service, they were just becoming, you know, noticeable to, you know, someone, someone like me. But in China, you know, the, the actual, the app opposite was happening and that, that, that globalization, that internet was giving them opportunities that had never been available to the former Soviet states or any communist country uh, during the first Cold, Cold War because we had completely shut them off. And so um, they had no access to our economy. They had no access to our university system. They had no access to technology. We had something called COCOM, which prevented uh, export of technology to um, communist countries during the first Cold War. And you know, over the course of my first 10 years in the military, the United States set about dismantling all those protections for um, not just America, but all of our allies and partners. And so in, in 1999, you know, I read this, uh, I read this interesting 
um, book called Unrestricted Warfare. And I talk about it in my book, War Without Rules. And it really describes a doctrine, a doctrine of war that's far different from war that I learned uh, in our military. You know, in here we consider war to be an aberration of, of um, what is mostly peaceful human activity. And, um, and the way that we approach war is that, you know, it's the last resort. It is uh, everything else has failed. And um, the earth, and, but uh, the U.S. national interest is affected, and we need to use military force to force some other nation to capitulate or to deal with a threat like terrorism. In uh, in this uh, unrestricted warfare book, uh, war is more of a continuous thing, and instead of um, thinking about using military force to achieve to achieve a political outcome. Unrestricted warfare really talks about using all elements of national power to achieve your national interest. And one of the things that's, I think, very, very um, prescient in, in, in unrestricted warfare is the recognition that nuclear weapons, while um, still being around, uh, nevertheless create a, you know, enormous risk for classical military conflict. So if you have two um, you, have, you have two uh, opponents and they both have nuclear weapons, not only do you create a risk for the country that might attack the other one, you also create a risk for humanity. And so um, the, the introduction of nuclear weapons, the introduction of uh, globalization, the internet, really, according to these, the, the authors of Unrestricted Warfare, made classical war too risky, and therefore we needed to use these new tools, globalization, the internet, and more of a continuous warfare campaign in order to um, you know, create a, a world that is safe for Marxism and Leninism, which is what uh, the Chinese Communist Party is. And so as you start to take that apart and think about it in the context of the first Cold War, what, what, you, what you're led to is the same thing that the Chinese were led to. By the way, they watched how we, um, how we defeated the Soviet Union during the first Cold War and how the former Soviet states eventually mostly turned to democracies. And they recognized that you know, Russia's approach, it's a centralized economic approach, it's, um, it's disconnect from uh, the international order um, and its inability to get hold of the technology, talent and capital was a was the failing of the Soviet Union. And so they endeavored not to do that. But they also recognized, and this is especially during 18, 1989, during the Tiananmen Square um, uprising, that ideology would flow through these connections, these economic, these financial, these academic, these, um, these social and cultural connections with the West and therefore, they needed to create uh, more of a defensive posture for that. So thus, the Great Firewall. In doing all of this, there has, we've had now, you know, since, you know, the 1999, you have now almost 30 years of, of continuation of globalization, the internet. And the reality is, you know, where we thought that at the end of the Cold War, uh, an opening up policy would transform not only the economic fortunes of countries like China, it would, con it would transform their political um, aspirations as well. And, and instead, what, what has happened is that the Chinese Communist Party learned so well the lessons of the first Cold War that they've actually turned the tables. And so they've created um, a, a a, a doctrine of, for warfare that has us basically uh, switching sides. So during the first Cold War, remember, um, it was the Soviet Union uh, teetering on bankruptcy that forced Gorbachev to, to change uh, course. Now the opposite is happening. You know, the Chinese uh, economy is ascendant, although it's been running into set, some headwinds lately. And the U.S. economy has been you know, decimated in terms of its productivity. Part of that process was the inability for, um, for U.S. companies to compete really well uh, with China because of, the, um, because of the way the Chinese economy works. It's not a market economy. It is, um, it is a command economy in that the resources 
of any company uh, when, when it finds itself in competition with another Western company, uh, the entire re resources of the nation are brought to that company's aid. And so in, a, in many ways, that, that capability, that capability to leverage the, the power of the state, whether it be resources or whether it be intelligence, what has made it very difficult for Western companies to compete. I think in this, by the same token, the relaxing of the rules for antitrust, um, you know, and the recognition that it's very difficult for companies to compete on the global stage has really resulted in the consolidation of economic power in the West. So if companies were going to survive in the West with what was going on in China, then they needed to grow in power. They needed to be able to consolidate. We needed to be able to um, reduce um, reduce the number of competitors so that we could create these very dominant companies that could compete in the global market space with a, with a very dominant country uh, in, in economically. Uh, the other thing that happened is that the internet really became uh, less of when I started, we had, I had a big honk, honking PC with a 4,800 baud modem. Uh, it became the mobile internet uh, with the introduction of the smartphone in 2007. Um, and then shortly thereafter, the introduction of 4G networks, which enabled the smartphone really to, to give way to the entire mobile economy, which created these enormously large tech companies. So all in all, what was happening here is, is that the small businesses were being squeezed. They were being squeezed not only by China, but by the consolidation of economic power in the United States. And um, along the way, the, there's some other things that were happening structurally within our economy that affected, I think, the innovation. Investment in, um, in science and technology during the first Cold War was at 2% of GDP and above. Uh, afterwards, and even now, it's like less than 0.7% of GDP. Most of that goes into uh, National um, uh, Institute for Health, and, um, and most of that technology finds its way back to China. And so there's been an enormous um, you know, centralization of economic cap power in large companies well, that's been supported by the corporate sector. It's been supported by the financial sector. And if you go to Washington, D.C., uh, in nearly every policy that sought to protect the country from the predations of China, those, uh, those protections have been watered down through corporate uh, and financial um, institution lobbyists. Uh, CFIUS reform was one of them. The CHIPS Act uh, um, was another. Uh, and the recent uh, investment and in executive order um, issued by President Biden, again, watered down uh, and uh, if you have just recently read a Wall Street Journal report uh, where uh, DuPont, um, you know, was selling a company, I want to sell a company to China, the Defense Department um, disagreed with that uh, because the loss of technology that was, uh, there was a potential for the Treasury Secretary, um, you know, supported it. Eventually, they did make the sale to the Chinese company. And of course, they saw they found that um, that that data from that was not supposed to go to China ended up being um, going to China. And so I think what you find now as we as we're trying to clean up this mess and it is a mess. You've seen uh, this corporate lobby lobby also um, be um, used against, um, you know, small businesses and inventors uh, in, in the form of the America Invents Act that was passed in 2011. Uh, that's really made it very difficult to protect your intellectual property. I just found out um, last week uh, from somebody uh, through LinkedIn that um, now because of the uh, agreement with, with China on patents, that if they patent their technology uh, in China, it gets fast-tracked through our own patent system. So, um, so now the Chinese have a, not only a benefit in that they can pretty much rubber stamp any patent. And there's been a lot of patents that's been uh, technology. And that was part of the paper that I saw when I was at the Pentagon. Um, technology taken to China, patented there first. And then now they can bring it over to our patent trade office. And then they can fast track it through because they already have a patent in China. And that's by agreement. So, so they are able to um, sidestep our 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 um, rigorous um, uh, 
you know, uh, process for looking at patents and, and approving them and basically fast track and get it patented. So who knows? I, we, have a, we have patents that are pending uh, those basically because we chose not to patent in China. Maybe they took our, our, our patent, patented in China. And now it's uh, maybe we're even competing with our own patent uh, in the patent trade office. Um, so I think by and large, what we have here is a, a world where globalization the internet has been weaponized by the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, it's all talked about in unrestricted warfare. We live it every single day. And the, the, the corporate and the financial lobby in, in the United States and other democracies, it's not just here, have done their darndest to keep from um, putting protections into our own laws and our own regulations and certainly how we, um, how we um, administer you know, our own patents. The, the way we've dealt with it as a company has been through trade secrets. Uh, we've sought to prevent, um, you know, anybody from having a look at what we do. Uh, we keep everything that we do uh, that we consider to be important um, off the internet. It's not even not even allowed to be in, on any computer that's attached to the internet, uh, because we believe so strongly that um, it, it, it's likely to be stolen. And and you know, um, <laughs> we do NDAs with large companies. But the, the fact of the matter is, I think um, we suspect any large company that, um, that does business with us uh, of, you know, likely to take our ideas, to go ahead and, um, and use them, and then come back through the, if we try to challenge those, come back through and invalidate it through the new patent process that was put in place by the American Vents Act. So as you look at this from um, you know, an, an American, you know, how do you preserve the Republic? How do we, what are the things that we need to think about? You know, it, 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 we have to go back to the lessons of unrestricted warfare. We don't want to become China. We don't want to become an authoritarian system, which is, it, which is the way that the country has been moving. And that's really by design. China put pressure on the free world in order to get the free world to begin to adopt its top-down um, it, its top-down uh, system, we we need to maintain our bottom-up system. We need to maintain you know our constitutional republic, and to do so, so, one of the most important precepts in unrestricted warfare is, as opposed to nuclear weapons, uh, you know, using the offensive, which we did during the first Cold War. We did that to reduce the amount of defense expenditures and focus on building our economy. Uh, in order to protect during this new form of warfare, you have to go defensive. And that means decoupling from China. It really means um, uh, investing in, a, in the technology talent of the country to, um, you know, one of the things I believe is reversing the America Invents Act, bringing back you know, a strict use of antitrust, working on um, the massive accumulation of shares in companies like com by financial institutions like BlackRock and beginning to level the playing field in a way um, that hasn't been done in a long time. And I think if we can do that, if we can return competition in the technology space, if we can return, um, you know, support for the small business, and if we can decouple from China, we're looking at, you know, what I would say is at least 10, if not more than 10 years of solid economic growth and growth of productivity, because there is untapped latent uh, growth in America get, just by virtue of the fact that our technology, talent and capital has been flowing into China. And we have been restricting the, the, the innovation uh, and the productivity of American companies by a lot of the things that we put in as a result of the end of the first Cold War. So, with that, love to hear um, any any questions and um, and any critiques. I I have a a question just to start off. So, to what degree has the problem been uh, made worse by the fact that these huge corporations uh, have who want to be in that Chinese market have an incentive to kind of partner up with China? Of course, they give away their trade secrets, which is a very bad long-term situation for them. But but they, here they are, very involved in our government and in influencing our lawmakers, and they actually want to have that Chinese market. So they're actually working against uh, what America needs. 
Well, I mean, it, it's absolutely, it is the key problem. It, it is why I said we can't um, create policies in Washington, D.C. that protect the American people because these corporations want to continue to do business with China. Uh, and it's really related to the stock price. You know, Tesla is a much more valuable company if they can include the market of China and the market of, you know, everywhere else they, they operate. And so it is by design in order for you to get the valuation of your company up, you have to add the Chinese market um, into your overall valuation uh, proposition. And that's that's dri what's driving all of these companies to do that. And you know, give, there's um, there's a couple of things that go along with that. One is um, there's no way to get your money out of China once it gets over there. So in, in effect, that capital gets stuck over there. That technology becomes theirs. And uh, and you know, uh, I, I said the other day, you know, they were um, they wanted to be builders, and we were gonna, and we thought we'll be the thinkers, they'll be the builders. Well, they wanted to be the builders until they could be the thinkers. Now they're the thinkers and the builders. And we're thinking, you know, what what can be what can we build now? And so I think it is a huge problem, and um, and I think the consolidation of economic power into you know just a handful of of, uh, of companies is not only skewed um, not only skewed the U.S. economy, it skewed our politics, it's it's skewed our society, it's 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 skewed our culture in ways that are not healthy and that are actually um, making us more and more like uh, China. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, I believe Joe James has his hand up. Go ahead, Joe. Can you hear Are me? You there? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, so I'm a tiny uh, climate tech company, and um, I, I've been opening, operating affiliates in different states, and I've opened one up in Canada. And what I'd like to report is that, um, you know, small, very small companies uh, use accelerator programs, business incubators and other things to sort of get their technology commercialized. And uh, I, I was uh, shocked about how aggressive a China controlled accelerator in Toronto was in coming after us very strongly. Uh, and and I, I'm fearful that uh, they may be also here in the U.S. Uh, trying to reach uh, small entrepreneurs that have cutting edge technology to try to capture that for China by providing a bigger incentive uh, uh, program for such entrepreneurs, but really trying to take that uh, technology to China. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Um, you know, it's 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 far. It was they, they, there's been like I said, little headwinds in China, but it's far easier for uh, entrepreneurs in China to get capital. And it's you know what the Chinese want to do is is basically get technology, and they want it for their own economy, and they want it for their own um, capability. And so um, one of the big things is to is to invest, in, and that's why Stiftius reform was created was to prevent that. Um, they, they were also using venture firms like, like Sequoia. I'm not surprised that they're using accelerators, but even in, as I mentioned, in Cepheus reform, you see things like this company um, that DuPont wanted to sell to China getting through the Cepheus process, uh, even though the Defense Department had strong objections to it. So um, no, I, I, this is, this is uh, part and parcel of the problem. And uh, it's not surprising to me that this, is, that this would, uh, would be the case. Eric, go ahead. Hi, I'd like to call attention to two exemplary situations in this regard. Um, sir, have you ever heard of a company called MagnaQuench? No. Um, you probably know about 3Com. Yes. Who stole the, uh, the technology of the entire networking stack off Cisco at one point to get going or at least their predecessor until, then, until they were renamed 3Com for the public facing market. MagnaQuench was a subsidiary of GM in the mid 1990s. At some point somewhere, somebody not only made on the corporate level the decision to sell the entire thing lock, stock and barrel to some entity in China, but it had to be approved at 
the usual bureaucratic defense department, DOD type of clearances and the like. I'm sure you're more familiar with them than me, even though I was a mill nerd who designed war games back in the 1970s, okay? Um, so China identifies what they have discerned in their own analyses to be key enablers, nexus of other intersectionality of technologies and their operations. Today, as an inventor in my area, if I want to use, to, to, to use um, uh, high efficiency neobium magnets, I'm likely to have to scout the world to try to avoid a Chinese source. This is an horrendous state of affairs and it was very, very deliberately planned from even long before that. Thank you. Yep, I, I absolutely agree. They've been uh, they've been uh, planning, particularly uh, rare earth metals. Um, rare earth metals have been something that they uh, that they you know own ninety percent of the market. And part of it, uh, not just um, China, it's us too. You know, the EPA will not uh, approve a processing facility for rare earth metals. And and you know, so we've taken this approach on the climate, on energy production. And uh, we've basically handicapped our own com uh, companies in our own country. And we thought that we were saving the planet, but in reality, you have far more dirty um, producers of those types of things in China. So we're still polluting the planet. We're actually polluting it worse because we're not using proper, they're not using proper environmental controls. Uh, and we're also punishing Americans who, uh, who, who, who could benefit from having those types of jobs. So it's a big problem. It's, it's something that um, both in the climate change, you know, um, policy and, you know, energy policy, we have been, we've been, uh, you know, it, it is the case that we are doing more damage to ourselves than China could ever do. Of course, they take advantage of our openness as well, which we could stop. But nevertheless, we, in many ways, are our own worst enemy. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, Karen, you're next. Hi, um, basically, I'm an inventor of a medical device and I have a startup company and I've been working with a product developer in Florida for the last three, three years or so. And he has, he has uh, connections in China. So my prototype was sent to China and it's new technology. So they're tooling, you know, the, the machine and everything. So I've been hearing a lot of, um, you know, bad news and really worrisome comments about working with China. But the problem is during COVID, um, I could not find a manufacturer in the United States that uh, I was basically priced out. And as a startup, I, you know, I don't have the funding for expensive manufacturing costs. So I had to go to China and I'm already two years behind in getting my medical device on the market. So... I'm really concerned that I don't have anywhere to turn other than to work with China. But with everything that's happened, you know, what I'm hearing and then with Taiwan and everything, I'm just, I'm really concerned about doing business with them. And I'm afraid they're going to steal my, my invention, my prototype, and I may never see it. <laughs> I'm really starting to get very concerned. So I know you can't give me legal advice, but what kind of, um, can you give me any other advice or information well well yeah i can say that it, it likely is um that your technology will be stolen that's just what happens when it gets sent over to china um i i do think that we're we're rapidly getting to a place where it's likely that china may invade taiwan in which case there will be an a um a, a separation between the two economies a much more durable separation uh which means that you know uh, while they may steal your technology, may only they only may only be able to sell it in China or at least in China and other authoritarian nations. I do think that um, that manufacturing is is um, is is coming back to the United States. It has to come back. We cannot uh, maintain um, our um, our lifeline to China if it if you know they do invade Taiwan. We're we're going to have this economic cut. So I think we're headed towards. Uh, a more permanent separation from China in the future, just because of um, the things that you, you, I see coming out of China. So, but the benefit, I think the good news is that we are gonna see a return to manufacturing here in the United States 
And, um, and so therefore, you know, it may be even longer before your product comes, but um, before long, I think you're going to be able to manufacture in the United States. Um, you know, it, it's, it's already started somewhat, um, and it's, but it's kind of start and stop. I think it's going to accelerate once, um, once China makes its move. I mean, I hope so, because my prototypes have been over there for about oh, at least a year. But my product developer has boots on the ground there. We had a team go there and, and they work very closely with this manufacturer. He has other clients and other projects there. So I have some, I had some sense of comfortability and now not so much. So, um, and again, the problem, like you just talked about, we need to get manufacturing back to the United States because, you know, it was just, there was no comparison in pricing between the United States and China. So I don't know. I mean, it's a, me it's a medical device that's really needed. It um, prevents, helps prevent urinary tract infections and there's nothing like it on the market. And, you know, it's a, it's a global women's health crisis right now. So I really need to get this on the market. So I'm hoping that things kind of stay calm in China and so I can get my samples and we'll see, what? I guess. Uh, there's, I don't yeah, have well, I, mean, you know, right I, now. I hope so too. I, that's a really... Uh... That's a, that's a, that's really um, an important thing, and, and we needed to get it out. So hopefully, hopefully it will work out. I hope so. Good. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here and giving us this information. And and Thank good you. good luck with that, Karen. One one thing you might look into that I know some people have done is they've had their tooling made in China because it was cheaper, but they've had it brought back to America where it was used. That's just a thought. But no, that anyway. I've actually thought about that. That that's that's something I've given a lot of thought to. And if I can pry it away from them, yeah, I think right. that's what I'm gonna do. Yeah. All right, Paul, you're up. Yeah. Um, thank you for uh joining, General. Um, so there's a company in Maryland that had about 20 employees and they put together a uh the owner of the company is one of our members, which is how I learned about this. Uh they created a a device that he called it a selfie stick that went on a, um, a smartphone. Zhao Mei knocked him off. He sued Zhao Mei in New York for patent infringement. Uh, the judge didn't want the case, so he dismissed it without uh, prejudice because they didn't have an office there officially. <laughs> but um, when they dismissed it, Microsoft, in the interest of Zhao Mei, challenged uh, those patents to the PTAB and invalidated the patents. So the case is Microsoft versus his company, but Microsoft did not infringe. They uh, took the case uh, to clear the market of US, of US patents for Zhao Mei. Now, I think what's happened here, and I wanted to, uh, I was hoping you could comment on this, tell me if I'm too far off base, but I think that Microsoft did it because they were asked to do it. And if you don't do what you're asked to do by the CCP or their, uh, the companies they control, then they're gonna punish you in some way. And these are not the first ones. There's, two, there's another member that has uh, Apple and Google challenging uh, patents. But I wonder if you had any, uh, any insight in that. I, I, I hadn't heard that before. You know, um, in my book, I talk about um, Patrick Genovine who had his company stolen by AVIC. Um, he uh, challenged them in federal court, ended up winning and went all the way to Supreme Court. And so he ended up collecting a judgment. I think that's the first judgment that's ever been collected against a Chinese company. Um, AVIC is the biggest, if not one, you know, second biggest uh, defense contractor in, in China. Um, the thing that he found out during, uh, during this uh, process was that any um, any uh, cases brought against um, a Chinese company in the United States, they have a centralized office in, in Beijing that quote that um, essentially um, uh, coordinates uh, protection for the company. So when you when you sue a Chinese company, you're suing you know China is basically. And so you think, as you mm -hmm. can imagine, that's a, a very um, difficult process. Um, but what you're, what you're saying makes a lot of sense in that, you know, Microsoft makes a lot of money in China. And so, uh, it is, um, highly likely that, you know, Xiaomi could go to, um, uh, Microsoft in China and say, Hey, you know, if this doesn't get taken care of, you know, uh, this could impact your ability to sell software 
in China. So then can you take care of this? So it does not surprise me at all that this uh, kind of behavior could, could be going on. This is, this is China. I mean, really, you have to understand, you know, when you, when you, when, when you understand kind of the way that, um, and this is not uh, so much the Communist Party, it's just the way people in China think. Um, you know, any negotiation is subject to renegotiation. Any contract is really not a contract. And um, anytime that you have a deal with somebody, you really have to take the position that you have to have leverage in that uh, agreement. If you have no leverage, if you're relying on the law, there is no rule of law in China. And in many cases, because the, the, the Chinese government supports the Chinese company in the United States, they're able to use our own legal system against us. And so, um, you know, anytime you're dealing with Chinese, you're just going to have to take a, an approach that um, you have to maintain leverage at all times in the relationship. You can never take anything for granted. You can't trust. It is not, there's no such thing as uh, a legal protection for you. You're just going to have to, um, to, to, to be very careful about it. Elon Musk has said, um, you know, he expects the Chinese to steal everything from Tesla, but he's going to try to make as much money as he can before they do. Um, you know, that's so I, I think, you know, I would debate whether or not I would do that with him, uh, with the Chinese. But I'm just telling you, that's the that's the way you have to think about anything that you do with the Chinese. If if you are going to do business with them. Interesting. Corey, go ahead. Hello, guys. Thanks for having me. Hey, you you guys are so on point. I worked 30 years in the manufacturing industry and also in healthcare industry. Everything you said was on point. But I think the problem is through acquisition is where I saw it come in on an acquisition point. Not only the materials, but they come in on a 60% interest and then the other interest trickle down. So what's the board? It's the board members allowing the acquisition to come in. So then when you see that and you see that your, your health care and everything policy start changing and no one has control over it and you go and investigate and find out that China has 60% invested in your company you've been working for. So, but that's not China's fault. That's, we are lacking the skills, right? There's not too many Americans that software developers besides myself. And I'll always claim to be the first minority software developer in America and the CIA know it. So it's my development is always between me and the CIA because I'm battling between the CIA. Now, I personally kind of gave up on my inventions and patents because the CIA always have hands and they always tying it in with China. Now I got I got I got I got AI technology that can electronically pause pause electronically pause um the AI system that they have. Now listen. Y'all y'all listen to this one. I hope you're Think watching about, back, man. <laughs> no, listen. No, I got to tell you this. This we it's about materials. Think about the alloys, the metals and alloys now. All the automobiles, you take all the automobiles on the road, let's say 6 billion automobiles on the road, okay? You turn them upside down, okay? Turn them, they robots, right? To take them to robots, fly them up in space. Take them up to a level beyond atmosphere, right? Sample it and, and what they did, what they doing, so they have an area where, that's why people seeing these um, ships and out of space things because, what they're seeing is what they're doing is testing it up in space, right? So eventually, when it comes down, so what I did was create. In case that happens, I got an elect electronic pause that will pause that because I reverse engineering. Hey Corey, so, hey Corey, Corey. Yeah. Since we're kind of limited on time, do you have a question for? Uh, yeah, for, but, for but, but basically, how can we? How can we get? How can we get the financial institutions? to work with the university technology resource department to eliminate this from happening. And we, and we keep it in America. That's what the problem is. It's from the university's technology research department, collaborating with financial big institutes like BlackRock. And that's how it's happening. We need to keep it in-house. 
That's what I wanted to say. Yeah, thanks. I, 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 I wouldn't know how to answer that question, but you know, one thing I will say about financial institutions is that, um, you know, like BlackRock, is that they are incredibly incentivized to uh, continue to invest in China, and it, that's you can just see that by the fact that they watered down President Biden's executive order on AI and chips and everything else. And so, um, you know, it's it's a big problem. It's a big problem also that they have, you know, roughly 10% of every major corporation uh, in the United States and other uh, Western countries is part of the BlackRock portfolio. Uh, it gives them an enormous sway over the boards uh, of those of those companies and over the executives of those companies, which, you know, um, that unfortunately, because they have relationship with China, gives them the ability to kind of direct policies in these corporations that are um, not good for uh, U.S. national interests. Yeah. So before anybody, uh, before the next question, uh, keep in mind that we have a very limited time. Uh, plan your question quickly, uh, get it out there quickly, and we can move on to the next person. Yeah, good point. All right, Steve, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spalding. I'm told that the problem with getting the administration interest in altering or helping us fix the patent laws of the U.S. is that the issue is just not high enough on their priority list. It doesn't matter where you go, it's not high enough. What government departments might you be working with or pushing on, and what kind of reaction are you getting? Because when I tried, I was told, hey, how does it compare to Ukraine? How does it compare to the issue with Russia and Taiwan? They're, we're not high enough on the list. Well, not only that, um, you, you can look at the Biden administration. There's a lot of people that worked at BlackRock. They're in the Biden administration. There's a lot of uh, people who worked at Google. They're in the Biden administration. So um, my my um, experience in Washington, D.C., is that large corporations have enormous sway over the policies of any administration. That was the same for the Trump administration. I saw their ability to um, to basically sway uh, the executive branch in, in ways that, you know, quite frankly, are counter to the things that you're saying. So um, it's not a priority for them. It, it's worse than that. It's actually a priority to go the other direction because a lot of the people working in the administration actually came from those companies that uh, want to perpetuate the system. So, it, you know, look, our, our nation in, in the last 240 plus years has seen um, ebbs and flows of, um, of corporate um, consolidation. Matt Stoller writes a great book called Goliath. It talks about the gilded years, um, the gilded age, you know, the robber barons. So this isn't the first time that we've had this. I think the, the, it is uh, something that we have to deal with every once in a while. And it's time to get back to antitrust. It's time to get back to preventing um, you know, the, the sway of large corporate interests and large financial interests in our government. And it, the only way that that happens is by, um, is by us having representatives to go to Washington, D.C. and a president that goes to Washington, D.C. and begins to dismantle this corporate lobby that's within our executive and legislative uh, branches now. Good. Hey, Julie, go ahead. Hi there, uh, General Spalding. My name is Julie Berg. I worked at the Patent and Trademark Office 20 years. I was a quality assurance specialist and I've written two papers recently, Law 360 researched on how China is uh, finding ways to finagle the US Patent Office to issue really quick patents for them. One of them is the um, Climate Change Mitigation Pilot Program uh, for Joe James. This was a way Biden had encouraged the Patent Office to create a fast track for U.S. inventors to try to get some patents out there to help with climate change, right? And China comes on in and they're taking over the wind power area. I wonder if there's any role for press is to elevate the public's awareness of what we're doing. You're correct. We are our own worst enemy. And I think there's things we could do, but what's your thoughts on the press? Well, um, you know, I think the press, uh, <laughs> what we know as a press is, is, is basically consolidated in four, five large corporations in the United States and BlackRock owns a significant shares of all of those. So it's along the lines of what I've been talking about, this consolidation of economic and financial power uh, in the United States has also affected the press. And so 
you remember we used to have a local press we used to have local papers we used to have the ability to have a diversity of ideas today you know uh, the, there is a there is a narrative there's an approved narrative and that narrative is what gets perpetuated uh, by the media by by what people consider the media i think what um what's needed in um and what i i see what i'm kind of very um uh, you know encouraged to see is that there are individuals that are writing for Substack, that are getting on Twitter, that are doing YouTube videos, that are doing their own um, investigation, and then they're just publishing in their self. So I think if we really want to say, what is the fourth estate? The fourth estate now does not exist in the, large, in the, in the five largest media organizations in the United States. It exists in the independent journalists that is using the tools of the internet to get um, you know new information out that people don't have. So I encourage you to to, to do that as well. I mean, uh, thank you for contacting me by the way on LinkedIn and sharing that with me. I was not aware of it. Uh, I do think it's a big problem because you know the 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 Chinese patent system you know is owned by the Chinese Communist Party, so they can do whatever they want. And then if they can fast track their patent because they patent something in China. Um, that is uh, that that's a that's that's a, that's the same as uh, we're subsidizing posted service from China to the United States, which you know I found out a long time ago. So yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, uh, Michael. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for this uh, great opportunity. Uh, uh, I'm Michael Novikov. Uh, I'm uh, based in uh, San Francisco, originally from uh, Saint Petersburg, Russia, and uh, uh, well, dealing with. Uh, venture capital deals like 26 years, but never with Russian money. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, when I finally moved uh, to the States, uh, to San Francisco uh, in 2013 and uh, uh, sitting with my uh, friends, uh, uh, local VCs, uh, I asked them, uh, why are you guys are encouraging uh, entering uh, Chinese companies uh, to here? And uh, the, question, uh, the answer was uh, very interesting. We Americans love competition. Uh, of course, uh, over the last few years, uh, that uh, trend, uh, like inviting Ch uh, uh, Chinese companies uh, to the States, definitely became weaker. Uh, and uh, well, but still, uh, uh, I believe uh, what we did with China uh, was, well, I wouldn't say our fault, but uh, uh, it was ab not absolutely uh, like very rational to transfer all, all, all technologies uh, we had and to encourage uh, Chinese entities to set up uh, their own uh, centers uh, all over uh, uh, Silicon Valley. All right. And uh, I've been adv advocating to move uh, production from China to uh, Mexico uh, for like a more than 15 years, 50, 50 years, or, and uh, even recently I uh, talked to uh, one VC fund uh, set up hardware accelerator, and uh, their original program was to let uh, startups to understand how Chinese uh, manufacturing uh, uh, worked. Uh, so, uh, like a pushing him to uh, reshift re re uh, focus uh, from uh, Chinese manufacturing to uh, local here in in the US or Mexico uh, or something else. Well, uh, uh, I don't have. It's a very rare case when I don't have exact question, uh, but. Uh, dear Robert, uh, uh, what's your opinion uh, on well, practical uh, opportunities uh, for us, uh, for the United States, uh, uh, to shift uh, manufacturing back, back to the country or Mexico, uh, or what other geographies uh, would you recommend uh, to consider? Thank you. Yeah, so um, the U.S. has an $800 billion defense budget. I think we ought to focus on deterring war and shift some of that budget to investing in science and technology and um, reintroduction of manufacturing. On Silicon Valley, I can just say I've, I have not been impressed by Silicon Valley in my five years in being private sector. I think um, you know Silicon Valley's heyday was when the Defense Department was spending a lot of money uh, in Silicon Valley developing uh, technology for, for the Cold War and the space program. And then those technologies were um, brought to the commercial market uh, and and in the, the, so that in that case, I would I would call that the virtuous cycle of Silicon Valley. I would call what's there today is you know more of a predatory cycle. Um, there's they're not really producing anything new. 
They're looking for the next viral thing. Uh, there's so many things that get that get started there, and then money gets rushed into it. I mean, right now the 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 last thing was space. Now it's AI, and I think there's a lot of uh, hype that goes into it, and uh, and quite frankly, not not enough innovation. And uh, so, you know, how do we get back to that? Invest in science and technology. Really invest in manufacturing. We have the budget to do it, and then um, and then I think you know, you'll start to see this virtual cycle come back. Right. That that sounds really good. Uh, Don Haslett, go ahead. Oh, you're on mute. You're still muted, Don. Okay, I'm a retired patent attorney, and I have more of an observation than a question, and that is that um, enforcement of patents in China is pretty much on a, a small a fragmented and localized basis and very difficult to achieve. And the other thing is that we tend to send our manufacturing uh, problems over to China. And as a result, uh, when somebody is manufacturing something overseas, uh, the problems are perceived there where the manufacturing is taking place. And as a result, the problems are solved there and uh, the resulting Patents are probably obtained by the Chinese rather than the Americans. That's it. Yeah, it's, that, that, that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, I think the number is something like 70% of inventions come through the manufacturing process. And uh, in not having a manufacturing process means that we have less uh, inventions that we can claim. And uh, that's absolutely right. That's especially true for TSMC, you know, the most powerful chip producer today. So. Taiwan made a decision they're going to they were going to own chip production. And as a result, you know, it's not the design that Qualcomm comes up with. It's that that's the big problem. It's how do you get that design to actually function in a chip? That's what TSMC does. And so um, you're absolutely correct. Manufacturing is so important to the innovation process. Yeah, makes total sense. Uh, Stan, go ahead. Oh, Stan, you're on mute. Still can't hear you. Stan, you're not on mute, but your audio is not working. Stan, sorry. Hey, put it in the chat. We'll take a look at it there. And uh, let's go to Merritt. Go ahead, Merritt. Merritt, are you there? If so, you're on mute. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. All right, perfect. Thank you for your service and thank you for your time today. I think um, for many of us that have like been talking to our reps for these past years, you've been talking about the China issue and what's happening. We're not getting like a really positive response from them as far as actually changing innovation. What can we do to get people in office that would actually care about this issue or understand it enough to, you know, maybe discuss it and bring it to the American people better? Have you ever thought about running for president or office? <laughs> My wife would kill me, <laughs> but thank you. Um, so uh, there actually there's a good book called the um, uh, the uh, politics industry. It was written by a businesswoman uh, named Catherine Gale. She um, she had a family food company up in uh, Wisconsin, they made cheese. Um, and she had this epiphany one day um, about her business uh, and applied kind of the concepts that she was, um, that she was uh, doing um, for a company to the politics industry. She wrote this great book um, and, uh, and she has some innovation, innovative ideas uh, for, for political, um, the political system. Uh, I highly recommend the book. She talks about things like final five voting and open primaries and gives a really good um, example of why um, either the Republicans or the Democrats don't really, um, uh, you know, do work for their uh, constituents. They rather do it for the parties and the donors themselves. And that's because the, uh, there's a mismatch in incentives. So highly recommend reading the politics industry. Uh, she has a um, Institute for Political Innovation 
uh, where they're working on um, changing the voting system. Uh, they, they recently passed uh, you know, um, legislation in Alaska to make that so. I think there's something like five states now that are, that are um, and, and what, what it does essentially is force uh, the representatives to actually reach across party lines, be much more bipartisan, because uh, they won't get elected in their systems unless they are, are, are more willing to uh, see both sides. And so um, I think there has been a, just like there's been a consolidation of corporate and, uh, and financial power in the United States, there's been a consolidation of political power for many of the same reasons. And, um, and you know, that's, that's something that the constitution kind of leaves to the states. And so the parties themselves have rigged voting um, into to preference their own political parties. And what I'm talking about here is the Democrat and Republican Party don't necessarily fight amongst each other. They fight, fight against any newcomers coming in. So what does that sound like? Sounds very much like we, what we've been talking about here, just reducing competition. So uh, if you're interested in stuff like that, um, th that's where um, I would recommend you get involved because uh, there's grassroots organizations that are standing up to, to, to fight um, the, for uh, the ability to have representatives actually, you know, do what the voters want as opposed to what the donors want. Yeah, that's yeah. what's frustrating. It seems like as long as there's this corporate lobbying, all of, I mean, it's nothing's going to change among anything until we get the money out of DC somehow, or figure out a way to get people in power that actually understand what's going on and care about changing it and fixing it and going back to what we had before, you know? Absolutely. Thank you. So two quick True. questions, General. First is, uh, who wrote The Politics Industry? Who's the author? Yeah, Catherine Gale, G-E-H-L. And um, the, the professor, I think, is named Michael Porter. He's a Harvard professor. Um, and he was helping her with strategy. And they got together. And she convinced him to, to co-write the book with her. Um, and um, yeah, Institute for Political Innovation is what she's founded. And real quick, I was on Amazon trying to buy your book just a couple minutes ago and i can't find it so it's called unrestricted warfare is that the title oh no of it? no unrestricted warfare is what the chinese wrote you don't want to write or you don't want to read that it'll, it'll put you to sleep war without rules i'll write it in the chat war without rules okay that's yeah. what i thought and yeah. it'll be on amazon and your name right as the author yep absolutely okay, all right now all right alex go ahead I thank you, everybody. Thanks for what you're doing for everybody here. Um, I have a thought. Uh, a lot of engineers here, we know if you give me the blueprint for anything, I can take the technology and own it. And this is what American companies have been done, doing for 40 years now. And this is basically how we delivered or you know, transferred every technology we have to Chinese companies. Now, since the beginning of COVID, the government here is pushing the corporations to shift to India and do the manufacturing there. Now, what's the guarantee that we're not going to have another evil giant like China in 30 years who's going to own all our technology and steal it, copy it, and compete with us? This is the one thing I keep thinking about, and it seems like it's on the on the track that the government put us on in 20, 30 years, we'll see the same results. What do you think, Robert? Thank you. Well, so yeah, so I think, first of all, I think um, one of the things that, um, that we have a great opportunity to do here in the United States over the next 10 years is build up Industry 4.0. We need infrastructure to do that. Uh, we need the ability to have the, both the compute, uh, edge compute and the, um, and, the, and the connectivity to do that. And, uh, and I think we also need to bring back, uh, and, and a lot of these things can be um, implemented through the Defense Production Act, uh, Title III of U.S. Code, that really forces um, some competitiveness, um, some reshoring of manufacturing. These can all be directed through the purchasing of the Defense Department. It's the biggest uh, purchaser in the country. It could basically uh, be the thing, the catalyst for getting these things back, and um, and so it's entirely within our hands, and it's and it's and it's for our own uh, for our own protection. So um, that's what I would do. I would I would unleash the Defense Production Act, Title III. I would shift the U.S. budget, um, the defense budget, to be more focused on 
We're rebuilding our science and technology dominance in the defense industrial base, focus on deterring wars. These are all strategies that we undertook during the first Cold War uh, and that served us really well. I think um, you know the, the same thing could be done now uh, and it's, there's no reason why we, why, why we don't. What right. do you think? What do you think about the India shift? Uh, just as a last thought, wouldn't that be a, as big of a threat like China? Um, well, I don't know that they would be. Uh, you know, they're obviously not not a Marxist-Leninist uh, system. Um, so I don't I don't put them on the um, equate them to China. Uh, but I do think that even if we do move some manufacturing to India, there ought to be a a, a, a certain a level of manufacturing capability that's maintained in our own country um, because we need it uh, in, in the case of, you know, some kind of crisis. So um, regardless of what we do with regard to India, I do think we need to focus on rebuilding the industrial base of America for our own production. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, Dirk, you're up. Uh, General Spalding, thank you so much for being with us here today. Um, I had a question. So in uh, Docket, Nav Docket Navigator released some information and some data uh, last year, and they showed how from the since the existence of the PTAB, which was 20, 2012 all the way through 2022, the top 20 users of the PTAB, there's companies like Huawei and ZTE that are playing around in the top 20. And I just wanted to know, um, one, what's your opinion? to what will your recommendation be towards the USPTO to how to deal with this? And if they even should be allowed to be on there to participate in that. No, absolutely. You know, full decoupling, in my opinion, is what's needed, which means they would have no standing in, in the United States for anything. There, we would not have an economic relationship period uh, with China, uh, which is the way we, we treated the Soviet Union. And I think furthermore, the, uh, the American Vents Act needs to be repealed uh, there's there is strong patent protections in our own constitution. There's no reason to have the PTAB. It, it you know it's a it is a it's a completely an invention of this you know hyper um, consolidation of economic power that we have uh, in this post Cold War era. So uh, something needs to be changed. Thank you so much. Yeah, we all agree with that. Um, so from someone who's uh, uh, audio audio wasn't working, uh, Dr. Spalding, highest plan planes go up to 10 miles. The lowest satellites are 280 miles. What do you think of the Chinese ruling the stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere? Um, well, I mean, they, there, there have been, um, we've talked about this for a long time in the Defense Department, is um, you know having the ability to um, prevent anybody from getting on orbit by having the ability to taking uh, to control those entry points uh, into space. And I think that is a big problem. Um, you know, I, I, you know, that being said, I do think that, um, you know, SpaceX has, has done a lot to kind of change the space industry, uh, but that, but nevertheless, we are still kind of confined to a few uh, launch points in the United States that if taken out, you know, we would lose our access to space. So I think that, um, you know, we cannot trust that in the good intentions of the Chinese Communist Party when it comes to our access to space and something that we ought to guard um, quite actively. And I do think that, that that's something, um, as opposed to a lot of the things that we've been talking about here, that's something the Defense Department actually is kind of interested in and willing to spend money towards. So um, they're just not, they don't care about individual inventors, which I think uh, if, we, if we thought, if they thought long and hard about it, and this is what I've been trying to get them to do is think differently about war. War doesn't just happen in space or in the air on the ground, it happens in, you know, in, in, in the boardrooms, it happens in courtrooms. And we have to think that way. And if we don't, it happens in our, in our legislature, it happens in, uh, in, in the executive branch. And so if we don't think that way, we're, we're gonna lose. So, um, but yeah. All right, uh, Charles, are you, are you, uh, yep. Hey guys, ahead, sorry Charles. about that. Hey, uh, I, no just, I just wanted to ask, because we had a, a person come on and speak to uh, the uh, China sending and mailing parcels to the United States and the United States is effectively subsidizing it. But yet I am still seeing China offering free shipping from Alibaba, uh, Tuma, uh, eBay uh, for, 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 for free. 
are we still subsidizing that? And what, what can be done on that? Because that's just in and of itself huge because I'm just watching patent after patent after patent and US product just getting hammered off of uh, Alibaba and Timu and, uh, uh, and AliExpress and all and, and eBay. What, you know, what, what's happening with that? Any, any updates on that? Because it still seems so. Be, I do. I do think. Um, I, I want to. Yeah, I want to say that there that we've put in place um, um, some timelines about when that will be off ramped. I don't know what the specifics around that are, but I do know that um, one of the one of the prevailing problems we have in terms of the tariffs uh, against China is that anything coming through this Mexican or Canadian border below eight hundred dollars doesn't get tariffed. So they've created these warehouses on the other side of the border so that they can they can move products into the United States as long as they're under $800 in value without having to pay a tariff. That needs to, that loophole needs to be closed. So um, they, they, they're buying up companies too on, on both sides of the, both the Canadian border and the Mexican border. So they're, they look, they're smart. And, and if we're not, um, if we're not thinking like them, then we're losing. And then my, my last question is, at- why is it Mexico jumping up and down saying we have the workers, we have the capacity manufactured in Mexico? Everybody keeps on telling me cartels, cartels, cartels. Is that what you're seeing? Uh, no, I do think that the, the Chinese are actually moving manufacturing to Mexico to, um, to get, off, get out from under the fact that they have tariffs. So um, I think the problem is, is, and this is what I said before, when we decouple and we don't force our partners to decouple, they become the avenue of attack from China. And so we have to actually basically not just look at what's going on in America, but anybody that has a free trade agreement or any kind of trade agreement, we have to look at what they're doing. We had something during the Cold War called COCOM as Coordinating Committee for Export Control. And US had veto uh, authority over any of our allies and partners that wanted to do business or, or expect to export technology to to the Soviet Union. So we need controls like that, um, where we're all working together as free countries to protect the free trade system, but also not allowing China to take advantage of, um, of uh, you know, not just, you know, America, but all of our allies and partners. All right, uh, Hans, Hans, go ahead. There we go. Um, I just wanted to first say, thank you very much for your service, sir. And uh, then I wanted to ask, Didn't we go through all this in the 19th century with the robber barons and all of the big businesses that were basically pushing political parties to do exactly what they wanted to do? And now we've kind of fallen backwards and and found ourselves in the same place again, uh, letting Silicon Valley and by way of Silicon Valley, places like Alibaba and the other tech places that go through China, uh, TikTok, and like that, haven't we just let them run ramshot over us? Haven't we, haven't we basically kowtowed to a foreign government and everyone said, yay, we're getting three cents off per dollar? Yeah, in fact, I think I said that early on in my talk, um, you know, mentioned the robber barons. Um, a good good book again by Matt Stoller called Goliath talks about this ebb and flow of, of economic consolidation and monopolies uh, within the United States, and we are probably um, at the same level, if not worse, than the the, the age of the robber baron. So um, I'm uh, highly in favor of antitrust. Not we have antitrust legislation. We actually I need to use the laws that are on the books, and, and we haven't for a long time. So. Absolutely agree with that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Robin McDaniel, go ahead. Well, thank you. And th- thank you, uh, Dr. Spaulding. Um, one, one quick comment. When I fly into China, I go down the coast into uh, Beijing or even down to Shanghai, you look out the window in the daylight and you see the wonderful different colors of all their rivers. Now that's <laughs> a consequence of, of them messing up their own environment. and. It's like that with patents. If they constantly uh, dishonor the patent system from our perspective, they're going to lose in unexpected ways. So I'm not terribly worried about that. My question for you, and I did look, didn't do the follow-up, um, isn't there a reciprocity agreement 
with the patent that, for example, in mine, when I, when I file, uh, they, they say, go ahead and file in Europe and you go, now it's time, it's okay, you have permission to go ahead and file in other jurisdictions. Doesn't the Chinese uh, patent office have that same kind of reciprocity with our fast track? Just, just a question. So, so I mean, you're absolutely right that, um, you know, basically um, part of the Chinese philosophy is to basically destroy the institutions of the, of the West and re and recharacterize them in ways that promote their own interests. Um, they, China does not have this concept of rule of law, rule of law. So where the law is impartial, uh, where you have due process, there's actually no such thing. Um, they have something called rule by law. And what that means is the Communist Party makes deliberations in secret and then they issue um, you know, to, yeah. to, to the legal system what decision they want to see come out. So um, bottom line is, and that's what I said, you know, anything to do with China, uh, whether this is geopolitics or whether you're negotiating on the street, in anything that you have, you must maintain leverage in that relationship. If you don't have leverage in that relationship, if they're not counting on you, Here's a simple way to do that. You know, if you're having something uh, done for you, uh, they're making a, you a suit or they're making you some product, uh, never pay up front. Always uh, make them deliver before you pay. That's an example of having leverage in the relationship. Um, I, I would not trust a single thing that has to do with any kind of patent or intellectual property to China because there's not going to be any enforcement that actually backs up your claims. It is all going to be based on what the Chinese Communist Party believes is in the best interest of China. So basically, I understand we keep it intellectual property um, in a trade secret method. Like, like behind me, I have all these computers that are not on the Internet for the exact reason you mentioned. Um, yes. So yeah. uh, the, the, other, the other big comment that I'd like to make is that it, as, as I've lived and traveled in China, I've noticed that their concept of intellectual property is totally foreign to them. For example, uh, my wife teaches in China and I go with her. I get to carry the suitcases, it's great. But she teaches there and one day she had one of her own books and she handed it to somebody and said, you, you all need to buy this book. So at lunchtime, one of them went out and made 30 copies on the photocopy machine in the lobby and came back and handed out 30 copies. No idea of what, per, if they own the book, they own the book and they can make their own copies. That idea is throughout their entire culture. Once they pay for something, they own it. You buy Microsoft Word once, <laughs> you give it to all your friends. It's crazy. Yep. How do we, yep. do, do you think that there might be some hope now that they have their own patent system? And now that no. there are a lot of uh, what they call sea turtles, uh, people who have gone to the West learn and come back to China. Do you think there's some hope that they might have some respect for patents and intellectual no, property no, in general? No, no, absolutely not. This concept that you're gonna transfer Western ideas, Western concepts, Western institutions into China is not gonna happen under the Chinese Communist Party. They, you, know, you read um, the Tiananmen papers where they talk about, um, they want the technology talent and capital of the West. They do not want the ideology and particularly the things that you're talking about. And so, um, you know, the, the, the concepts of, of uh, Western liberal democracy are actually dangerous for the Chinese Communist Party. And what you're talking about, um, essentially private property, that is a concept that does not exist in China, nor will the Communist Party ever allow it to exist to, yeah. in China. So, um, you know, and they built a very, very good uh, and capable way of controlling the narrative in China. Um, school kids are taught from the ground up that, uh, that the, the, the only religion in China is the Communist Party, and they owe all fealty to the Communist Party. This is backed up by the media system. It's backed up by all the institutions of the country. So it's a completely um, you know, closed society that has been engineered for um, the Communist Party's total control using technology that, in many cases, we develop. So there's no way to, to really kind of go over there and say, hey, I'm going to try to teach these people. This is what I was told when I was a student at Tongji University by a lot of the business people that were there in Shanghai at the time. They go, oh, we're going to transform China. You're not going to transform China as long as the Chinese Communist Party has control and they are instituting what they believe is um, a plan to protect themselves 
from being overthrown because the Chinese people become, you know, sentient. So, so guys, we've, we've kept the general on way longer than we expected, but one last question from Molly Matz, but, but Molly, make it, make it a short one. <laughs> It's actually the shortest one. I just wanted to ask the general what he's doing on October 19th. Uh, October 19th. I don't know what I'm doing October 19th. Is there something that I should be aware of? Yes. Tell him, Molly. Um, yeah, you're going to be with us in D.C. at uh, the USPTO office. We have uh, the U.S. Okay. first annual conference. Yeah. Sounds great. Yep. I look forward we to it. Yeah, we'd yes, love so I consider speak. that okay. you're an in. You're you're in. <laughs> All right. All right. So so General well, Spalding, it's, it's convenience in my backyard. So. <laughs> so so thank you so much for being here. This was a great talk. You know, it, it it one of the things I have really gotten from this talk is how important a group like ours is because it's grassroots movements that fight against exactly what we're talking about. Now, of course, it's a big fight, it's David versus Goliath, but but this is this is how things get done, and uh, we're we're gradually getting there. And uh, so, thank you for your talk. And you know, I know that I'm sure Paul is thinking about how good you would be as a witness in a hearing on the China Select Committee when they start talking about our issue. But anyway, hopefully, we can get you in there. Um, but anyway, thank yeah. you, everybody. Now, well, now, by the way, we're going to talk a little yeah. bit about some issues with U.S. inventors. So if you want to go ahead and leave now, uh, Dr. Uh, General Spalding, you can, or if you want to hold on, you can. But thanks again for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much. Take care. And uh, for everybody else, a um, couple things. Paul, were you about to say something? Sorry, I cut you off there. Yeah, I was going to talk about the 10-year uh, the, uh, anniversary. The tickets are on sale. Um, it's important that we have a really strong showing of inventors. Uh, please uh, come and visit us in uh, the USPTO on the, uh, what is it, the 19th? Cassidy, what dates are that? October 19th to October 21st, and it's at the USPTO building. And it uh, looks like we're going to have a really good speaker, General Spaulding. Uh, we have, uh, I believe, Adam Mossoff, uh, I believe Judge Michelle. I think we have some other people that are lined up. Um, but it's real important that we show up, um, that a lot of inventors show, because we have to show numbers uh, on this uh, thing. So please come. Uh, and if you have, if there's some reason you can't make it, but you want to make it, contact uh, Cassidy. Um, and we'll try to find a way to make that happen for you. And, and we're offering a big discount for everybody on this call. Uh, if you commit to... Uh, to coming um, and Cassie will, will provide you a link in the follow-up. Uh, we're gonna take $150 off of the uh, entry fee. So it'll just be $100 uh, as an entry fee. And by the way, it won't just be speakers like Paul mentioned, it will also be speakers talking about, for instance, for litigation uh, funding. How do you set yourself up to attract litigation funding? There are certain things they're looking for. If you check off all the boxes, you got a good shot at it. Um, so uh, if you don't check off the boxes, it's tougher than ever right now. So in, there'll be a lot, we'll have some patent attorneys talking about key issues at the moment and uh, all kinds of stuff like that. So hope you guys can attend. Um, the other thing is right now they're in their August recess. That's where all these con senators and representatives, they're in their home office, their home district, which is right near where you live. And now is the time to get a, a meeting with your representative and or your senator especially your representatives. They're right there. A senator might be a little further away, might be a little tougher to get to. If you can get to them, great. But the representatives, they're supposed to meet with you. You're, you're, you're the voter, right? They're, they have an obligation to meet with you. Do your best to get a meeting with them to talk about our issue. We'll do our best to get other constituents to join you and to have one of us, one of, our, one of the key executives of U.S. Inventor, be there as well. But yeah, and we'll coach you. If, if we can't be there, we'll coach you up and you'll be ready. But, but we should be able to get one of us there as well to, to be part of it. So do that. This is important. Um, and I think that's it for now. Paul, is there anything else? Have I missed something? I, well, I don't know. I can't think of anything. I'm still absorbing <laughs> all that information that came in on this call. So yeah, this is a good one. And, and of course, guys, this issue is helping us bring our issue to the top because it's a key part of the whole threat of China, right? That the, the serious threat of, of this adversary. So this is helping us. So now is the time for us to push it to the max. Now is a, a window of opportunity. Um, 
So help us. It's very important. This is for our country. And uh, I, had, I had one wow. thing that I want to bring up. One of our members got a hold of the senior person on the China Select Committee, and we had a meeting with them yesterday. And they are now, this is a, this was completely new. This senior member did not, uh, senior staffer had no idea that the, any of this was an issue related to the patent system. So we've been able to, uh, we were able to show, show how uh, China is ahead of us on tech related to um, why, the, you know, the, our broken patent system. And now they're digging in. They've asked for more and more information. They've connected us with uh, other media sources. Um, there's a anybody if you can pick up the phone and call, um, they may help you. And if they do, in this case, uh, we were connected right uh, right to exactly the right person. And uh, but call your reps. Show up at their uh, town halls over the next couple of weeks. There will be some in your in your, locally. Um, but we need to make noise. We need to show numbers. We need to uh, basically raise hell. Um, and it can't be done by just a couple. We all got to do it. And, and every single phone call you make, even if all you do is leave a good voicemail for your reps, uh, voicemail, right? You call and leave a voicemail on our issue. Think about it ahead of time, kind of get it worked out so it's quick and efficient and it's not like rambling, right? Every one of those calls, they log them, they log them, they look at them, and they make a difference. And uh, this is helping our, our whole movement. So thank you for your efforts. And uh, we're, we're, we're moving the needle, guys. We're really doing it. So thank you. Uh, thank you for being a part of it. And uh, we'll see you next time.